Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Ah, nice and alert folks today. Um, today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the great Vincent Schraldi. No one, I think, since the late Paleolithic era has referred to him as Vincent. Um, people mostly know him as Vinny. Um, <coughs> uh, in terms of his bona fides, uh, he runs the program uh, on criminal justice at the Harvard Kennedy School right now. Um, uh, before that, he was at the Justice Project. Um, uh, he also ran uh, uh, <coughs> juvenile uh, uh, justice uh, initiatives in, in D.C., um, ran probation. He was a commissioner for probation uh, here in New York and was a senior advisor to Mock J here in the city. All of those are uh, Vinny's fancy. Um, <coughs> but the things to know about Vinny, and you guys who have been here uh, who are Justice Nerds veterans understand that this is the essence of the introduction. The thing to know about Vinny is, unlike almost anyone I have ever met before, Vinny has this freakish legacy of actually changing institutions. Anybody who's ever been in an institution, right, and I'm not talking about those kinds of institutions, but anybody who's ever functioned within an institution, you understand that is not a normal thing, right? You have once every five or six generations, maybe someone comes along, they change the culture a little bit, they get a statue, it's nice. Vinny's got a life where four, five different stops along the way, the institution is fundamentally different with different metrics of success and different ways to engage deeply in the communities that are affected by it. Right? In that way, he is kind of like the grand maharaja of doing social justice within policy institutions. So my hope is today that we'll be able to benefit a little bit from that wisdom. Let me get out of your way and as usually bolt to my class. Please join me in welcoming today, Vinny Schiraldi as our justice nerd. Hello everybody, how are you? Let me just see if this works still. Yeah, it does. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little today about um, a paper that we just published at the Kennedy School. I co-authored with Patrick McCarthy, who's the head of the um, Annie Casey Foundation, Miriam Shark, who works at the Casey Foundation, and myself as part of this National Institute of Justice funded uh, executive session on community corrections and focused on um, uh, juvenile institutions and took a look at the future of youth justice uh, through that lens. Um, and our, our overall uh, conclusion after looking at a ton of research in the area of developmental psychology and sort of the history of juvenile facilities, uh, their legacy of abuse and neglect, racial disparities, uh, is that it's a model that needs to end we need to actually not have juvenile institutions anymore, or youth prisons as we call them, to avoid euphemizing them, and that it should be replaced with a system of largely community-based in-home service support, services, supports, and opportunities for the kids uh, that don't need to be placed in locked custody. And then when kids do need be to be deprived of their liberty, small, decent, home-like facilities near their home communities, not large things that feel like prisons. Um, not saying no one should be in locked custody. I think that some kids, uh, because of their behavior and for their safety and for our safety, uh, need to be in locked custody, but those should be very few, much fewer than we currently have, uh, and they should be um, decent, humane, and, and as small and home-like as you can make them. Uh, so I'm gonna go through the paper, so that's kind of what that says, uh, and I'll go to this one. I'll give you a little history, um, discuss the model of institutionalization as itself inherently flawed, talk about some of the costs and outcomes, unwar unwarranted disparity, abuse that's endemic, not idiosyncratic, uh, some of the challenges to reforming the model, because it's not illogical to say, well, why don't we just fix these places? Why do we have to completely jettison them? I'm gonna talk about the experience I had running Washington DC's juvenile justice system and get into some recommendations. So youth confinement, uh, youth prisons began in the US in the 1840s with the Lyman School for Boys in Massachusetts in 1846. It was a time of great change in the US, rapid urbanization and immigration. People were freaking out over Irish and Eastern European kids who were running the streets in urban areas while their parents worked long hours in sweatshops and factories of the time. They were different, they were Catholic, they weren't Protestant, 
Um, they had different morals and values. We didn't really trust those morals and values. The dominant society didn't. Um, uh, and so they created this new model, which would take them away from their families. And that was really a major thing at the time. The families were the major societal institution for controlling behavior. Uh, and so we replaced that with the state. We actually had a Latin phrase for it called parents patriae, the state as parent. Um, uh, replaced that um, about 170 years ago, and there were scandalous abuses right from the get-go, right from the beginning. Kids being leased out for labor, uh, 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 physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, newspaper scandals, right from, right from the jump street. Uh, there was never a moment when the institutional model was a good one for kids, or for adults, by the way, but I'm going to focus on kids today. Fast forward to the 80s and 90s, uh, which there was a pretty rehabilitative ethic for the, for the juvenile justice system, the juvenile court, at least in name. The, the goals were still rehabilitative. Not a lot of due process protections for kids at first. Kids could just be deprived of their liberty without the same rights to trial and, and confrontation of witnesses. During the 60s, the Supreme Court granted a lot of, uh, of, of adult-like rights to juveniles uh, to confront witnesses. You didn't have the right to confront your witnesses uh, in juvenile court before the 1960s. Uh, so that was that sort of due process revolution in the court. Uh, but it still stayed with rehabilitation as its basis. Uh, and then in the 90s, that, that was really called into question in a very deep uh, and serious and racially charged way. It was a tough on crime era, stoked initially by uh, a, an actual increase in crime, later just by the appearance of an increase in crime. Uh, and researchers and academics like James Allen Fox and John DiIulio seem to be competing on a weekly basis for uh, the, the quote of the, the vitriolic quote of the week. Uh, James Allen Fox predicted, for example, quote, a bloodbath in about 10 years from our young people. John DiIulio said there would be 270,000 more young predators on the streets requiring uh, 150,000 more correctional beds for kids, which was pretty stunning because we didn't even have 100,000 beds when he said it. Uh, these pronouncements were sort of wrapped in a, in a racialized theme, sometimes barely disguised, sometimes not disguised at all. Uh, De Julio wrote, for example, quote, the black kids who inspire fear seem not merely unrecognizable, but alien. Further stating, quote, all that's left of the black community in some pockets of urban America is deviant, delinquent, and criminal adults surrounded by severely abused and neglected children, virtually all of whom were born out of wedlock. Make some of, uh, of uh, Donald Trump's proclamations, and, uh, uh, dystopian proclamations about black communities seem uh, tepid. Um, to this, uh, he added his most durable epithet, branding America's youth as a rising tide of juvenile super predators, a phrase that Hillary Clinton had to walk back during her uh, recent attempt to, 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 to become president. This did its damage. It really had a major impact, a major influence on policymakers at a time. For example, the legislation in 1996 to try 13-year-olds, federal legislation to try 13-year-olds as adults and to allow 13-year-olds to be uh, uh, housed in adult facilities, co-authored by um, Jeff Sessions, by the way, was called the Violent Youth Predator Act of 1996. Legislators in every state in the union during the 1990s uh, uh, made it easier to try kids as adults or to lock kids in adult facilities. And the uh, number of kids in youth prisons peaked at 109,000 in 1999. This is despite the fact that somewhere around the mid-90s, juvenile cr crime started what would become, and still is, a 20 plus year decline uh, in, in crime. Uh, down, violent crime down 68%, uh, juvenile violent crime since then, youth homicides down by 83%. Uh, we're still digging out of that mischaracterization today. One of the interesting things uh, was that this engendered a backlash of its own. And that backlash included advocacy, included civil rights organizations fighting it, but Another thing it included was a, a, a research backlash, which you don't really hear much of, right? Kind of 
makes academics sound a little kind of tough, right? Now we were in there fighting. Um, but they got uh, uh, the, the MacArthur Foundation and the Justice Department Foundation uh, said, well, what's being said here is essentially, um, it's a core attack on a juvenile court. There's this notion that if you do the adult crime, you should do the adult time. And so the question was, were kids really different enough than adults to warrant this special treatment that the juvenile court gave them? These sort of confidentiality protections, more rehabilitation, more individualization, and separate facilities. Do kids really deserve that or don't they? And part of that's a moral and philosophical question, but part of it's a research question. Are kids different developmentally than adults are? Lo and behold, this, this, this research backlash discovered that kids were indeed different than adults, and, and in many respects, more different than we had actually understood previously. For example, a lot of the brain science research discovered that not only are kids' brains developmentally different than adults' brains are, but that they're still developing well into the 20s, uh, much longer than was previously thought. Um, so, so what did they discover? They, they found that kids are more volatile in emotionally charged settings than fully mature adults are. And by the way, they're not more volatile in not emotionally charged settings. That's why you can have a personal, perfectly reasonable conversation with your 17-year-old son about Aristotle and the philosophy class he's taking in high school, and then he can do, uh, go out and do some bonehead stuff that evening with a bunch of his friends. Um, more susceptible to peer influence. Not, I, didn't, I specifically didn't say peer pressure because lots of peer influence is good. That's why we put our kids on, in plays, on, on basketball teams, and in the science club, and in the in 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 Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, because we want positive influence. It's not all negative peer pressure and gangs. Less future oriented and greater risk takers, especially in the presence of peers. Uh, so the, the developmental research also found uh, to mature, uh, it's not just that your brain needs to develop, but you need certain experiences to help you mature and matriculate out of uh, delinquent behavior. You need the modeling of pro-social behavior. You need the opportunity for decision-making and critical thinking, positive interactions with adults, and pathways to success. And sociologists really contributed the most to this. They found that particularly when males who make up about 85% of crime get married and or have a stable employment, uh, they, uh, that helps them significantly matriculate out of juvenile delinquency. This is exactly the opposite of the kind of things you receive in America's juvenile institutions, youth prisons. Those are about confinement and control. Uh, they pit kids against one another and against staff in the facilities in, in, this, in this sort of dynamic and struggle. They exacerbate trauma, which uh, many young people already show up at these facilities having experienced. They limit opportunities for learning, hinder the chance of stable marriage, uh, and uh, thwart career path employment. And for all of these reasons, uh, youth prisons can be criminogenic. They also cost an enormous amount of money, uh, almost $150,000 per kid per year. In New York, it's about $250,000 per kid per year, and they produce uh, lifelong negative uh, 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 individual and societal costs, lost future earnings, higher spending on Medicaid and Medicare. About 70 to 80 percent of kids get rearrested within two or three years of release from institutionalization. It's not easy to tease these things out because you don't randomly assign kids to incarceration or not incarceration, so the comparisons aren't perfect. Um, but some of the more sophisticated research we looked at showed higher rates of rearrest, school failure, exacerbated mental illness. In fact, many kids experienced an onset of mental illnesses during institutionalization, and as I said earlier, lower employment prospects. Of course, uh, this is not equally distributed across the population. Uh, racial disparities, as in adult prisons, are rampant and unfortunately growing uh, in our youth prisons. Uh, so uh, Hispanic youth, Latino youth are locked up at almost twice the rate of white youth. Uh, American Indian kids, what's going on? A little more than three times. And African American youth at about five times the rate of white youth. This masks 
some really nasty disparities in some states. Uh, New Hampshire, black kids are locked up at 36 times the rate of whites. New Jersey, 25 times the rate of whites. Wisconsin, 16 times the rate of whites. Um, this is getting slightly worse. There's been a nice substantial decline in the number of kids locked up in juvenile facilities in America. It's down 53% since that peak I mentioned earlier. Uh, so there's about 53,000 kids in, in locked custody today, but as it's declined, racial disparities have grown slightly. Um, we took a look at some of the uh, research on racial disparities because some, you know, it's reasonable to say, well, black kids commit more crimes, so that's where they get locked up more, and that's certainly a, a pushback that you sometimes hear. Uh, but again, the more sophisticated research is showing that it's much more complicated than that, and that there's a tremendous amount of unwarranted disparities in the system. So Pope and Fireherm did a meta-analysis and looked at all the sort of gold standard research on this and found that two-thirds of, uh, of the good studies that uh, teased out uh, 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 legally relevant factors like current offense and prior uh, criminal arrests uh, showed, uh, two-thirds of those studies showed unwarranted disparities at one or more stage of the system. So between arrest and detention, between detention and charging, between charging and conviction. Um, one study I thought was particularly interesting was uh, uh, done by uh, uh, researchers Bridges and Steen in an uh, unnamed northwestern state. They uh, took hundreds of probation reports and uh, screened out the, uh, the you know, uh, eliminated the names and race of the kids on the reports and then had their uh, staff, uh, their uh, students, score them on a, on a variety of different indicators. And they found that when you control for uh, prior arrests and current offense, that uh, probation officers were more likely to, to ascribe the delinquency of white kids to external factors, right? Poor home environment, something bad happened to the kid, it was sort of extraordinary, uh, uh, but black kids to sort of internal factors, these kids are kind of bad seed and based on that, we're more likely to recommend incarceration and more likely to recommend longer incarceration than similarly situated white kids. U.S., as in many other uh, negative areas around criminal justice, is the leader in incarceration. Uh, this, uh, this may have gotten a little better because some of this is dated, and as I said, uh, our uh, incarceration rates have declined, but uh, we incarcerate way more than, uh, than the rest of the, the, the world. So one of the things that always sort of gets me about the way most of the public experiences this is that, and, and a lot of policymakers as well, is that they experience it idiosyncratically. Uh, something terrible happens in an institution. Uh, 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 it gets on the front page of the paper, or the Justice Department sues, there's a commission that gets established. There's a lot of uh, storm and drang, and uh, and then um, and then it seems to fade in, into the distance. And, and during those times, people think, "What's wrong with this administrator of this facility, or this department head, or or what's wrong with these kids? They're like a new breed." But rarely, because we because each state sort of in, uh, experiences them separately, do people say, "What's wrong with this model?" that keeps consistently producing these outcomes. Um, so we looked into whether this was idiosyncratic or endemic and found that it was endemic. Uh, the Casey Foundation did a, uh, this, this map here, um, which showed that in all but five states, there were systemic or recurring cases of maltreatment. Some of these states had it numerous times during this period. Uh, the Associated Press in 2008 published a, a, a report that they uh, surveyed every agency in the United States that incarcerates young people. Uh, they found 13,000 allegations of physical or sexual, sexual abuse in facilities ho housing 46,000 kids. So that's one report of physical or sexual abuse for every three or four kids incarcerated at the time. It's a stunning, stunning amount and it's always been my experience that kids underreport, in part because they, they don't want to be snitches, in part because many of them come from environments in which violence is so prevalent that the bar for them feeling like they've been the victim of violence is higher than it is 
for other kids. Uh, in 2012, the Department of Justice uh, surveyed youth in correctional facilities around the U.S., very sophisticated survey methodology, and that revealed that one in eight youth reported being sexually assaulted over the preceding year, one, of, one in eight youth incarcerated. So here's what this looks like when it actually happens. There's no telling it, it's a, it's, a, it's a picture's worth a thousand words. But that's, uh, that's some of the footage uh, of Khalif Browder being assaulted by staff and later by kids in uh, Rikers Island. And it, if you go to the uh, New Yorker, uh, they, they have all that footage up there. It's, it's, very, it's very upsetting. Um, so why not, why not just fix these things? Uh, you know, why can't we just make this better? Um, I, again, a, a reasonable... Uh, question and it's something that I think is the instinct of most folks in government particularly. Most folks get into government thinking they can fix the problems that exist there. Uh, and I, th I think that's, a, that's perhaps the most important question of anything that I'll discuss today. Um, because I, I believe that this is, is, a, is a problem that really is endemic to the very nature of institutionalization. When you deprive people of their liberty in closed institutions, institutions into and out of which the public doesn't get to flow, they inevitably entropy into bedlam. Um, uh, Jerome Miller, who's a, a mentor of mine and was the former secretary of the Department of Youth Services in Massachusetts, posited a cyclical nature to institutional abuses. I kind of alluded to it earlier. There's a, 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 a atrocities occur in these facilities that break publicly, there's a lot of public attention uh, gets brought to, to them, there's a commission gets established, there are a series of articles in the paper, uh, people focus attention on them for a while, uh, engage in uh, fixes that are designed to leave the basic nature of the institutions themselves intact, but improve them by adding programs, changing the administrator, retraining the staff, but they leave the very core of the institution themselves together, then attention wanes and people move on to other issues, the places deteriorate again, uh, and there's a scandal and, and once again calls for reform. Uh, Jerry wrote in his book, reformers come and reformers go, state institutions carry on. Nothing in their history suggests they can sustain reform, no matter what money, what staff, and programs are pumped into them. The same crises and, uh, that have plagued them for 150 years intrude today. Though the cast may change, the players go on producing failure. Uh, correctional historian uh, uh, David Rothman uh, perhaps put it more succinctly, and he said, or well, he wrote, when custody meets care, custody always wins. So. I'm going to spend a little time talking about the experience I had uh, running the Washington, D.C. Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, which is the Juvenile Justice Agency for Washington, D.C., but it fits very much into what Jerry Miller and, and David Rothman said a moment ago. Uh, when I was hired in 2005 to run that department, uh, it had been under a uh, consent decree uh, for 19 years with some of the best institutional litigators in the country, the Public Defender Service of Washington, D.C., and uh, the Am American Civil Liberties Union National Prison Project. Uh, I was the 20th director of the department in that 19 years, so a little more than one director per year. Uh, in that year before I got there, 
uh, Covington and Burling Law Firm, which is a it's kind of a big firm in Washington D.C., was actually at the time Eric Holder's firm, although he didn't he didn't work on a case. Uh, added into the suit, and usually when when that happens, when a big firm comes in, they add a lot of resources. So they brought a bunch of investigators in and did a thorough investigation of the department. At the same time, the uh, city, the Washington D.C.'s Inspector General's office uh, also investigated. So there was all this horrid material available to me when I started. Uh, and they found that uh, 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 the place was bedlam in almost a, any way you could imagine it being bedlam. And again, this was after 19 years of oversight by the court. Um, staff were regularly beating and abusing the kids, uh, locking them down uh, for inordinate amounts of period of time. And this is not just the kids that got put in solitary. It was a whole unit of kids just in solitary confinement. But this was all the other kids, too. The kids who weren't in solitary spent an inordinate amount of time in their cells during the day just because staff were so overwhelmed and undertrained and you know not, not experienced enough that they would just lock the kids down. Uh, the, the solitary confinement cells had bathrooms in them because the kids were expected to be in them 23 hours a day, but the non-solitary confinement rooms didn't. And so kids would often bang on the cell doors and staff wouldn't get to them in time, and so they'd urinate or defecate their cells, which was an incredibly humiliating experience for them. Uh, the, phys the physical conditions of the place had deteriorated so much that um, there were cracks around the floor where kids would take their shirts off at night and stuff them into the holes so that rats and cockroaches didn't crawl up on them at night. And they did, and the kids would show you the bites that they had on them. Um, the boilers uh, were ancient uh, and unregulated. The regulators just broke on them, so heat would just pour out of them. So if you slept in a room that was close to the boilers, you were in a boiling hot room. If you slept far away, you were in a freezing cold room. Bad for anybody, particularly bad if you have asthma or if you're on psychotropic drugs, which our kids were disproportionately on, uh, and especially bad if you had both were on, at, on, on psychotropic drugs and had asthma, which was not uncommon. Uh, so all of this was part of this crazy 20 years of litigation, 19 years of litigation, during which there were we were up to memorandum order Q. So uh, you get a memorandum order when you don't comply with the last thing you promised to do. So this is a major consent decree, and then ABC all the way through Q in 19 years, so almost one order per year which meant my staff was completely confused about what the, the case, the court case said. One of the things that it said was don't put kids on, who have asthma or are on psychotropic medication into the hot rooms. While that facility was open, I never went to sleep thinking that my staff was gonna follow that rule. Not because they were trying to kill kids, but just because they just really, they were so completely confused by what they were supposed to do uh, that um, that compliance was, was random at best. Uh, when we started, we started learning stuff that we didn't even learn from, all, from those reports. So one example was staff was selling drugs to the kids so frequently that kids tested positive more often after they had been in the facility for 30 days than when they came in, because we tested them when they came in. So kids were actually, it was easier to score drugs in my facility than on the streets of the District of Columbia. And I want to tell you, that's a pretty low bar to jump over. Um, there was this rampant sexual assault going on, not just between staff and kids, but between staff and other staff. So female staff learned pretty quickly that if they didn't put out for their supervisors, they might find themselves in compromising positions alone with no help forthcoming. So that was the sort of lay of the land when I got there. Uh, this is what the place looked like physically. You can see uh, it, it was very prison-like ambiance. Tons of razor wire. Uh, this is sort of, can somebody shut the lights back there? Thanks. Is that okay? Uh, this is sort of the, the kind of cell block looking room. This is a you know, metal desk and chair. This is a metal bed. You can't see it that great. Um, plastic crappy um, uh, mattress that kids uh, slept on, bars on the window. 
uh, grates over the bars, so, so the light is kind of filtered. Uh, this, this is actually one of the better windows we had. The, most of the windows, these were plexiglass windows. The kids had, because they were in the room so much, had, had scraped them up so much that you really couldn't even see through them, which is kind of, you know, it's, just, it's a crazy sign that a kid sitting in the room scraping their fingernails against the window. These were, this is just a classic example of how institutions work. So these, these are, you purchase these on like correctional magazines online. Well, then, then there were actually physical magazines, but now they're online. These are super heavy chairs, so kids can't pick them up and throw them at you, and they're kind of indestructible. And so they just live forever. You can't get rid of these things, right? And um, so instead of sort of creating an environment in which kids flourish and wouldn't want to destroy furniture and you just buy furniture like that and then ignore the kid's behavior. And this sort of summarizes it all for me. <laughs> Oak Hill is the name of the facility. So um, in order to kind of change the culture there, we, we, did, a, we did a bunch of things. Um, one was, before I get to the culture change, we, s we established a continuum of community-based programs. We actually got the community folks in a room and said, all right, tell us what kinds of programs you think would be good for the kids, and we'll procure them. And that was providers, but it was also family members. Kids were involved in that discussion, community leaders. We put judges in. We basically were like big tent, lots of donuts and coffee, pieces of paper up on a board, and everybody was writing it down. And eventually they said, we want you, we want you to kind of put the money out into the community, regionalize the District of Columbia into two regions, east of the river and west of the river, which is kind of the way DC breaks itself down, and uh, let those lead entities, not service providers, let, those, let, let there be a lead entity that doesn't provide a lot of service, it just brings us together collaboratively and, and, and funds a bunch of services, supports, and opportunities for kids in the communities. And we didn't just call them services, because supports and opportunities are also important, right? So. They, um, they then funded a whole range of stuff from like, that in, yeah, sure included like multi-systemic therapy and all those kind of evidence-based practices, but also included things that uplift young people, that build on their assets. Actually, Jeff Butts, who's a professor here, helped us a lot in this area with po what he, what, what he kind of dubbed positive youth justice. And that was sort of uh, the concept there was to build on young people's assets like we were trying to build on our own kids' assets. I was fortunate that I had a 12 and a 14 year old during this time. So here I am trying to, like my daughter was playing a viola at this time. But really, there was never a moment when there was any chance my daughter would ha be any good at playing a viola, right? I mean, she was bad at it the day she started and better at it the day she was done. And yet we, you know, we rooted her on, right? We were with her on that the whole way. We were gonna pay for those damn lessons and she was gonna be on the school band until Finally, she figured out on her own and moved on, right? And you know, that's the kind of thing that like middle class people, white middle class people take for granted, that we can suck at 10 things because there's gonna be number 11 that we can be good at, right? And we don't have to worry about like this being the only thing, but, uh, but for the young people in these facilities, they're lucky if they get one or two chances to be good at something. And they gotta jump at that because they never know when another one's gonna come by. So we were like, nah, that's not the way it's gonna be. We're gonna fund opportunities for them so that they can experiment with dance or karate or fill in the blank. And so that's what the neighborhoods did. We didn't come up with that ourselves. I was like, no good can come from a government bureaucracy trying to figure this out. Let's let the neighborhood people figure it out. And it, sure enough, they did. So we funded that as a way to reduce the population. And then we just, we, I had control of the kids. I was the parole board in essence, so I could release the kids. And then we just started putting them in these programs in the community. So we got the population that was like 280 kids when I got there. And I ultimately, you'll see later, built a 60 bed facility. And today it's 40, there's 40 kids in that facility. So we got the population way down. And um, it was tempting to gradually depopulate every living unit because there were 280 kids in a 208 bed facility. So there were day rooms about the size of this room with kids sleeping on them on plastic cots. But I didn't do that. I basically emptied one living unit at a time, left the other ones just as crowded, you know, kept reducing the population. 
And then I took the staff out of that one unit and sent them to training for a month at a hotel. And uh, the state of Missouri had done the best work in the country, oddly enough, um, uh, uh, around its juvenile system. Its juvenile system is stunning. If, if you ever get a chance to go to see the juvenile justice system in Missouri, you should do it. Small, decent, rehabilitative, home-like facilities near to kids' homes, no large institutions left in Missouri. Everything's maximum 40 beds, but mostly 20 beds or smaller. So, they're, well, Missouri like is a it's, it's a non-union state, so they they pay their staff terribly, and they're, they're cheaper than lots of other places. Um, so, um, so the the architect of that had retired just before I started and set up a consulting shop. So I got him and his folks. I hustled a bunch of money from DC foundations. They uh, provided funds, and we uh, we had them train my staff for a month. And you know. To be fair to staff, they'd never had any kind of training like this. They had been trained how to handcuff kids and turn keys and locks and a bunch of garbage, but not how to turn young people's lives around. So we were going to change the atmosphere there. Everybody's job, including the cooks and the maintenance people and everybody that worked in that place, whose job was going to be to turn young people's lives around and build on their assets uh, in a youth development model. And the Missouri folks were going to help us do that. So staff went away for 30 days and... Uh, um, we brought in, uh, uh, we had planned this in advance that we were going to have our maintenance staff, the young people themselves, and a bunch of dignitaries from the community, like the mayor came up, and uh, um, Maya Angelou came up, Marion Wright Edelman, a bunch of judges, a bunch of city council members. You know, we were bringing people up. They were going to paint and plant flowers and try to make this sow's ear of a facility into as much of a silk purse as we could. So um, this is the result. Still doesn't look that great. OK, so don't, don't, like, don't, don't expect too much. But, but we painted the rooms. It's a little hard to see, but the floors were carpeted. That made a big difference because one part of the maddeningness of the place was the din from, from everything being so hard. We bought wood furniture, wood, wood uh, bureaus, wood. Uh, beds instead of that, you know, correctional officer bed or correctional magazine bed you saw earlier. Allowed kids to put stuff on their, on the walls, uh, and got nice comforters. The comforters is an interesting story, because I, I, you know, I I thought I was going to hate the staff when I went to work there, because I was an advocate for my whole career, and you know, I assumed that any place where this much damage was being done to children, the people must just ooze, you know, just ooze evil. Um, and it was way different than that. Certainly, there were plenty of sadists there, and you know, I was able to fire a bunch of them. Some of them I would like to have hired back and fired them again because it was so enjoyable <laughs> to fire them first time. But a whole bunch of people wasn't. That wasn't true. They were, they were actually pretty decent people. And there's this one guy, to, the head of safety. So I'm going to tell a story now. So we used to have just uh, army blankets on the beds, um, uh, you know, gray, ugly army blankets. And when we were doing this makeover, me and, me and one of the people on my staff went and found pretty blankets to put on the beds and ordered, you know, a whole bunch of pretty blankets. And, yeah, I kept coming up for the facility because I was, you know, super interested in this. And uh, the, the army blankets were on the beds. And I was like to the saying to the staff, why are the army blankets on the beds? And eventually somebody told me, our safety guy, Crawley, what qualifications this guy had to be the safety guy who knows? I mean, he just Peter principled up to be the safety guy at some point. But Crawley said, we can't put those blankets on the beds. I was like, really, why is that? I don't know, you got to find Crawley and ask him. So great. So I looked for Crawley. And who knows what hole Crawley was hiding in all this time. And finally, I found him. I said, Crawley, how come we can't put the pretty blankets I ordered on the beds? He said, well, they're flammable. I said, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that, that was a thing. Are the other ones not flammable? Uh, oh, I said, well, how'd you know? How do you know that they're flammable? He said, well, I lit one of them on fire, and it burned. I said, okay, that's interesting. Uh, so are the other ones not flammable? The army blankets aren't flammable? He said, oh, I, n I, I don't know. I never, I never tried lighting one of them on fire. I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Try and light one on fire, see what happens, and then let me know. So a lot of administrators didn't. The facility was like 45 minutes outside of D.C., so a lot of times the administrators didn't go. But I was going all the time. So I, I wanted to see what was going on in this place because it was my only big 
facility. And so I went back up like every week and I haven't seen Crawley. Crawley, did you, did you do the fire test? No, I haven't done it yet, I haven't done it yet. So I finally said, all right, man, let's go get in the car. We're going to the warehouse, bring your matches. And you know, sure enough, the, the, the gray army blankets burned. And I was like, Crawley, you're not one of the bad guys here. You're like not the evil, sadistic guy that beats kids up. You're actually a pretty decent guy. I see you playing with the kids all the time and interacting with them in positive ways. What, what place did you put these kids in where you only lit the pretty blankets on fire? What does that say about how much you dehumanize these kids in your mind? And I think that really was what a lot of it happened was a lot of staff who, this is a 280 bed facility or 80 kid facility. Anybody got a kid in a school that's about 300 kids big? Anybody, anybody in a room? Middle school? Like, how big? Anybody got a kid in middle school or high school? 300 is a small school, right? If somebody was selling drugs, if a, a staff member in a 300 person school was selling drugs to the kids, everybody would know who was doing that. There's no way you could keep that secret. So everybody know who was selling drugs to the school to the kids in the facility. Everybody knew who was having sex with the kids or pressuring other staff to have sex with them. Everybody knew. Everybody knew who was beating the kids up. Everybody wasn't beating the kids up. Everybody wasn't having sex with the kids. Everybody wasn't selling them drugs. It was a small minority. But everybody was looking the other way. Everybody had put these kids in enough of a place of dehumanization where they would do a thing they would never do on the outside. Most of them had their own kids. They would never allow somebody to beat kids up, have sex with them, and sell them drugs. But inside, those kids were different. So I'll take you through the rest of these. The Missouri model, you know, the kids don't, especially the boys, don't really verbalize very much. So there's a lot of stuff that we did, like genograms, and a lot of stuff was done in writing. What was my life like in the past? What would I want my life to be like in the future? Um, as I said, Maya Angelou came up. Look at my. So that was just a fantastic day, and she was so wonderful with the kids. But look at the razor wire behind Maya Angelou there. It's just unbelievable. Um, uh, when uh, President Obama got elected, Charles Ogletree uh, held a forum. Uh, he was an advisor to President Obama on justice issues, and so he held a forum to ask for expert advice on uh, juvenile justice, and he invited me to speak. Uh, but instead, I asked if, if, if the kids could speak uh, because there were no kids on the panel. Uh, and so they were the opening panel to it. They did fantastic, by the way. Uh, we built a, a ropes course inside the facility. I had this terrific, uh, uh, you know, once you start turning things around, you actually attract good people or, and also find good people in your facility that step to the fore. So I, I, we got this... Uh, recreation director, who this guy was just off the charts, fantastic. And uh, he uh, got a pile driver for some, from some place, you know, it's something that you used to put poles up. And, and the kids and him built a uh, ropes course. Uh, he also um, did this jointly with Gallaudet University, which is a college for deaf kids in Washington, DC. So in order, or deaf students, in order for our kids to do this, not only did they have to learn all these construction skills and pile drivers and stuff, but they had to learn how to sign so they could work cooperatively with the, with the Gallaudet kids. Um, and then what happened after that was they learned how to run the ropes course. So all the people who wanted to do those kind of stupid you know, retreats where you do the trust falls and you walk on a high ropes course, they all came. Like, so every department started having their annual retreat up in my correctional facility run by the kids. It was really cool. Um, football team. We always had a good football team because there were a ton of football players uh, that worked in the facility. Sometimes that wasn't a good thing. But we always had a good football team. But every year, if we made it to the playoffs, we would forfeit the playoffs because all the games we had during the regular season were in the facility. So uh, DC high school kids would come up and play us. But DC high school refused to have the playoffs in a correctional facility 45 minutes away from the District of Columbia. So they would always have them in a regular high school in DC and none of the previous administrators had let the kids play in the finals. So they would get to the finals and forfeit. So I said, nope, we're gonna authorize as much overtime as it takes to secure that field, but we are going to the playoffs if we make them. And we made them and we won the uh, city champs that year. 
So we were city champs in football that year. And then we bought the kids all these leather jackets like you get when you're city champs with the little you know, city champ logo on it. And I gave them to the, to the DC council and they stashed them you know, behind the little council chairs. And I brought the kids there and the kids had no idea that they knew they were gonna get some you know, applause from the city council for winning the city championship. But then each council member whipped out a jacket and put it on the kids. It was really great. Um, we performed, uh, there was a competition, a Shakespeare competition. Every year they say it's not a competition, but it's totally a competition. Um, and uh, so we performed in that. We were the only all black troupe in it, and uh, we won. We were, we were uh, the best ensemble, and our Lady Macbeth uh, won best actor. And that's the mayor in the middle there, who when he was a kid was an was a intern at that theater. That's my daughter there. And that's me over there. And uh, my wife's taking a picture. My wife and daughter uh, volunteered as part of that. Still, even with those changes and improvements, the proudest day of my career to this day is the day we closed Oak Hill. So while all that was happening, we were designing and building this much smaller facility. So I was kind of getting the population down, hoping that by the time the facility was built, I would have the population down to 60 and we'd be able to fit. And sure enough, we did. Uh, and this is what the new place looked like still does look like. It's uh, more of a, like a kind of nice college campus look. You can see what the kind of landscape looks a lot nicer than the previous place. This is what the day rooms look like, none of that hard correctional furniture anymore, couches, you know, uh, nice carpeting, lots of light, which you don't usually have in correctional facilities, wooden doors as opposed to metal doors. Um, this is what the inside of a room looks like. You can see uh, what we did was we, uh, painted one wall in every room with chalkboard paint so that, uh, and then just gave the kids chalk so that that took care of any graffiti problems you used to have. And some of the kids were pretty good artists. You can see this kid was impressed by Maya Angelou. That's, that's her doing her best Stevie Wonder impersonation down in the bottom right hand corner there. Uh, a couple of other cool features were the, this little knob here opens the window. So you had control over your window, which you never have in correctional facilities. And what you can't see from this is that all these doors you can get out. You can, uh, they, they all lock at night, but you could press a button and your door would open. Uh, the, this, if it's the middle of the night, this, this little light would come on, it'd be a low ding, so that staff know you're coming out so that, and all the other uh, doors would disable when you open yours, you have to go to the bathroom uh, so that 10 kids can't rush out and jump on a staff member at night. So you go out and do your business, you close the door, and if somebody else has got to go to the bathroom, they can go to the bathroom. So that's you know, a little thing, but that's an enormous amount of power for a kid to suddenly have returned to them. Uh, we got a welding program. We, the cops, we, we, got, we hooked up with the cops and this Blacksmiths Association of Central United States. Who the hell knew such a thing existed? But uh, and the cops donated all these guns to us that they seized in crimes or that they bought in those gun buyback programs. They would disable them and donate them to us and the kids would turn them into art. We called it Guns to Roses. Um, uh, we had a fantastic gym. We were 15 and three that year uh, in basketball. Uh, and uh, this was at theater. It was a, a, a 150 seat theater with uh, sort of parents and kids and uh, DC officials and you know anybody could come. Uh, and this was the outside. You see it's a kind of a curved back to this. There's the outside wall. Uh, the kids selected, uh, uh, we had a competition and the kids selected this artist and then jointly with the artist they, they put this, uh, this mural up. And this is just a sort of farewell play there. So I'll, I'll, I'll end soon. Um, we the, the, the paper, back to the sort of paper, we recommended uh, that we eliminate all youth prisons in America, replace them with small, home-like, decent facilities and a continuum of care. To get there, we need to reduce the pipeline into youth prisons. You need to reform the culture and the assumption that we're only really doing something with kids if we lock them up. We call it, we call it an edifice complex. Or kids, something's only happening if you put a kid in a building. Uh, replace youth prisons with small home-like facilities because youth prisons don't work and they actually produce worse outcomes 
and then capture those savings and reinvest them into community-based programs. I'll give one final example of Texas, because uh, it's just Texas, right? Um, and that had a, a, a scandal. We, we, we use several examples in the book, Ohio, New York, Texas, California. They all start with a horrible scandal. Texas is, was ritualistic uh, sexual abuse of the kids where staff were actually feeding kids to the, uh, to the hierarchy in the, in the facility. Uh, and this really offended particularly the very religious conservatives in the Texas legislature. So in 2007, they uh, uh, did a raft of reforms uh, that substantially reduced the number of kids locked up in Texas. It's now down by two thirds. Uh, but they uh, said basically nobody convicted of a misdemeanor could get locked up. Uh, they capped how long you could stay locked up, so it was substantially shorter because kids were just staying forever. Uh, and then they captured the savings, which are $150 million over two years, uh, and funneled a substantial portion of those into community-based programs to, uh, to divert even more kids from locked custody. So in the first six years, that resulted in a 38% reduction in youth confinement in Texas, during which time to show you that this wasn't a jailbreak, there was a 49% decline in youth arrests in Texas. Just by way of comparison, at the same time, adult imprisonment dropped by 2% in Texas, so a small decline, and uh, adult arrests uh, declined by um, 8%. So put another way, uh, there was n the youth confinement dropped at 19 times the rate of adult confinement, and yet uh, youth arrests dropped at five times the rate of adult arrests. Now, I know that implies causality, and I know I'm in a university, so I'm gonna quickly add. I'm not saying that the decline in youth confinement caused youth crime to go down, but it would be hard to argue that this substantial policy-driven decline in youth confinement was a jailbreak that, that uh, jeopardized public safety. I could give you these charts for Ohio, for California, for New York. New York's declined by, uh, past close to home in 2012. It's declined by more than half the number of kids we have in locked custody in New York City. And uh, juvenile arrests are down by more than half during that same time. Uh, I could give you this over and over again, but I think Texas does it. So that's it. Uh, this report can be found there if you want it. Uh, and questions? What, what, what's our time parameter, by the way? Are we okay? Are we, um, we have about 10 minutes. Cool. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, very to see that talk. Thanks. Um, I wonder, uh, you mentioned uh, Jerome Miller and what he did in Massachusetts. And I wonder, why did it take so long for there to be a duplication of that to the Missouri or what you did? Yeah, well, uh, you know, Jerry's timing was bad. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was great for the kids in Massachusetts, yeah. but he did that right before this massive uh, war on crime that America went through during that period of time. Basically, if you look at the incarceration rates in America from like the 20s to the 70s, actually, the commission that uh, Jeremy Travis chaired, took a look at this and found it was pretty flat, you know, for, for that 50 years. And we were pretty similar to, you know, European nations. And then it started spiking in 1973 and kept going up until 2009, a sort of the story of mass incarceration. So when Jerry did this, it was 1972. And so he did it right before uh, crime as a salient political issue caught on. Uh, and so his reforms lasted for actually a decent bit of time in Massachusetts before there was a horrible case and then they opened up a bunch of institutions. And they did catch on in a couple other states. Pennsylvania did some stuff, Illinois did some stuff, Utah, uh, but they got swept away in the, in, the, in the war on crime. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing this with us today. It's wonderful work. It's so exciting to hear it. Um, I'm wondering if you
you can speak to any sort of reentry services that the kids receive after being in these types of programs, particularly because it's a better type of problem to have right when they're getting all this support and coming back out than when they're experiencing all this abuse. But I can still imagine it'd be a tough transition if you're going back into a community or household where you don't have those kinds of opportunities and support afterwards. Yeah, so the, the lead entities and the uh, service coalitions were available pre and post. And we had, I would say, <coughs> mediocre case managers in our employ. Uh, they got better over time. We actually fired a whole bunch of them and brought a whole bunch new on and trained them, but they were okay. They were never in, up to my snuff. If my kid was in trouble, they wouldn't have been good enough. Uh, and their job was to begin planning for the kids' reentry as soon as they got there. Uh, they more or less did that. The kids were only there with a six, seven months, so you had to kind of hustle in and get that done. But then all of those programs that were available through the lead entities were available to them when they came out. <coughs> the other thing that we did that was really, really great um, and was we uh, got rid of the public school and brought on a nonprofit school to run the school. The school was terrible. It was awful. Um, and uh, did, did anybody see the op-ed piece by James Foreman in Sunday's Times? Right, so James and his uh, colleague David Domenici ran a school called the Maya Angelou School. That's actually how we got Maya Angelou to come up because they knew her. Uh, and they, their school came in and ran the school. So the school had, uh, we, we, we contracted with them. They had a 90-day post-release school too. So that helped uh, ease the kids back into the community. Some of the kids stayed longer just because they could, they could graduate. So there was no point in them going back to regular school. Uh, so between case management, the, the, the lead entity services in their communities and the school, that was pretty good. Hi. Um, sorry. Um, so my uh, research interest in my area is um, in like criminal behavior and also just looking at, um, especially with juveniles and children. So I definitely agree with your model and removing them away from uh, these prisons. I wanted to ask you: Have you ever seen, either in your experience um, before or now, known that correctional officers are they ever trained in understanding like? I guess the brains of uh, youths and that they should not be, I guess, handled in the rough manner that I, I now know that they are um, and how that affects them and will be affecting them in the future. Yeah, and I why mean, aren't they trained? I, I feel like they're not, obviously, because yeah, well, they weren't what I hear. But uh, they you. weren't prior to us in initiating the reforms. They were, it was really a correctional model. You know, you sort of were a turnkey. That kind of defined your job. You were security. You weren't treatment. If the kids had issues, well, we'll send them to the psychologists as, as if you know, we're sort of going to go someplace and get magical psychologist dust poured on them and you know, turn their lives around. So there was really no, it was kind of interesting. There was no sort of plan for how this was going to work. It was just you were going to go there and do your time and come out. It was, even though it's a juvenile f system and you would think there would be more of a rehabilitative ethic, it was really kind of just a prison. It was kind of a badly run prison. And so it was interesting when I started, one of the best things about the lawsuit uh, was that the policies and procedures were actually really good. I didn't, because that's a pain in the neck to rewrite policies and procedures. And I think it's a whole process. Is you got to post things. You got to negotiate them with the unions. They actually were pretty good. Just nobody was following them, but, but they were pretty good. So the job descriptions for what my correctional officers were actually described what I would have liked. We didn't hardly change them at all. They were supposed to work with kids, try to turn their lives around, be therapeutic, but nobody had ever trained them for that. They had zero qualifications and a high school degree. Some of them had GEDs. There was no educational qualifications. So we did the, the massive 30-day <coughs> training, which doesn't sound massive, right? You guys are in college, right? It's taken you four years to be trained. 30 days was like a miracle for these guys because none of them had training before that. And then we kept the Missouri folks on. We actually had enough money to keep the Missouri folks on 35 days a month. So we had teams of folks. So that that moment when a kid spits in your face and cusses at you, you don't hit the button on your chest and the four football players come beat the kid up and stick him in a cell again. You calm down, walk away, let your colleague deal with the kid, and then come out and hold a group session on dignity and respect. Right? Let's just Pause over that for a second. That's hard for anybody. 
But it's especially hard if for 20 years you've been hitting a button on your chest and four football players removed this angry kid from your face. Um, so, so that was the initial training. And then we, st we established essentially an internal training academy where people had to get a certain number of hours, I can't remember how many, per month of ongoing training. And we trained in de-escalation, we trained in, in uh, adolescent development. Uh, the uh, handle with care, it was this sort of de-escalation, and that's not the name of it, we actually, there was a different one, so never mind that. But there was a, there was a whole process of training staff on how to restrain kids but instead of doing that, because that they had they had that down, they were restraining kids like crazy. Uh, it was actually embedded in a de-escalation training, so you would go to restraint training, but you'd learn de-escalation, and the very last thing you would learn is how to restrain a kid. Uh, so so things like that, and then we started to hold conferences uh, twice a year, where we would have academics come in and talk about a whole variety of things, including adolescent development, but different program models. So staff started to feel good about themselves, like they were educated, and they were sort of, they were elevating. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure many of you have been to conferences, but if you've never been to one, like the, think of the first time you went to a conference, like you got the little bag with the pen and the t-shirt in there. They kind of felt cool, right? You got like stuff and you went to the, you know, there were workshops. I'm gonna go to this, what workshop are you going? And you talk about it afterwards. You know, that, like, Trust me, I, I got still plenty of stored up anger about my staff and, uh, and the things that they did and certainly they should have been held accountable and many of them ended up being held accountable for those things. But some of them just were stuck in a crappy environment and a job they couldn't afford to quit. And when we started training them, some of them, not all of them, turned turn their, turn their, uh, themselves around. Also, I stuck around for five years. I, you know, I wasn't one of the 20 that left in a year. And that meant a lot, too, because we all give good speeches in the first five minutes, and you, you feel a little like a chump if you believe in it, and then the person's gone in a year. So I stuck around for five years, then my chief of staff took over, then my general counsel took over, and then one of my deputies took over. So now it's been, from 2005 to now, 12 years of, right, that's 12 years, yeah, 12 years of the same general ethic was before, you know, some of those 20 people were, some was really lenient, some were really punitive. Uh, so you combine all that stuff and it did begin to create a different culture. And then one other thing we were able to get was we were able to get the position changed so it required an associate's degree. I couldn't go back and make that retroactive. So everybody that currently worked there, whatever degree they had, they had. But um, for all new hires, it was an associate's degree. And that meant that, that folks were at least more amenable to the concepts of training than folks that had sort of stopped their education in high school. So that was, that was our sort of whack at that. Yeah. All right, so. One Make it a good one, there's a lot of pressure on you. Uh, yeah, I see that, <laughs> right? Um, why do you think that uh, this figure, cost figure per uh, kid, which ranges hundred to 150,000, okay? It seems like a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. And we're not getting, it seems, you know, the bang for the buck <laughs> out of it, you know? You would think, I don't know if the staff is not getting part of that money, you know? Who's getting the money, yep. you know? Where is it going, you know? And why can't we get a better uh, product, if you will, not to put it in commodity? Yeah, no, 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 I totally agree. So um, I think a lot of what the money gets spent on now is the wrong stuff. It's just correctional. It's, it's garden kids. And, you know, when you have a very unrewarding job like that, then it's all about the money. I mean, the only reason you're doing it is to make money. So, like, one example was... Uh, uh, staff, if, if you were on a morning shift and you were held more than 15 minutes after your shift was over, for whatever reason, you got an hour of overtime. So basically, you work 15 minutes, you get paid two hours, right? So I'm your buddy. You're getting off at three. 
I come 16 minutes late. You'd be stunned at how, like there was a rush coming into the facility at 3.16 every day. Not at 3, at 3.16. So everybody on the morning shift worked 16 extra minutes and got paid two hours. Um, so, you know, bit by bit, uh, New York's a great example. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember when, when Governor Cuomo, his first state of the state speech, uh, he had been to a prison, a youth prison, up in uh, upstate New York, Tryon. Right. Yep. That was, he, when he visited it, he actually visited it between when he got elected and when he started as governor. So it was November. And he went, and it was completely empty of kids, fully staffed. What had happened was under Governor Pataki, uh, the, the unions and the upstate legislators cut a deal that said if you want to close a correctional facility in New York State, adult or juvenile, you have to give a year's notice. So during that time, the local legislators, the local business community, and the unions would fight the facility closure during the budget process. And so that's, that's what stage Tryon was at when, when, um, when Cuomo visited it. And then shortly after that, uh, Mayor Bloomberg visited the Finger Lakes facility, which had two or three kids in it and was completely staffed. That adds up. You, you do stuff like that, so especially now, as the number of people in correctional facilities, in juvenile correctional facilities, was declined by 53%, right? So as, as it declines, generally speaking, the government doesn't stay up with facility closures. Uh, so we're paying for a lot of empty space, for a lot of guards, like recently, last year, there's, only, there's a 250-bed facility in Connecticut, Connecticut Juvenile Training School. It's the only facility left in Connecticut, and there's 40 kids in it. And last year, the budget for that facility was $53 million. Now, this year, the governor dropped it to like $30 million. But it's still $30 million. It's $30 million for 40 kids, so it's uh, 800000 per kid. Um, because it's just hard, you know, for government to, like, lay staff off. And, you know, it's just like kind of, it's hard to downsize in some respects. And it's in nobody's interest except for the budget people. It's not in the department's interest. As a department head, it's in, in my interest to keep my budget as big as I possibly can. It gives me fewer, right, if you think about like sort of the mission and then the interest of bureaucracies, it's in my interest to hold on to as many assets and resources as I can. That's, that's the game we bureaucrats play. And so if your if you're, uh, uh, goal is to, is to sort of wrench away from the correctional industrial complex resources, you better come with all your pads on. One thing I would suggest, uh, by the way, because now we've moved all those kids in New York State, all those kids are now local. They're not upstate anymore. There, there's a legislation that Cuomo and Bloomberg got together on called Close to Home. So now there used to be like 500 kids upstate. I think there's like 160 that are now down in facilities throughout the city of New York, ranging from six beds to 20 beds, you might want to suggest to Phil that he have Felipe Franco come here and talk about the close to home facilities or that you get to visit one. Because it's about the same amount of money, about $250,000 uh, 250, per kid per year, but now they're in small rehabilitative facilities. I would strongly suggest if you can get to go to one, that you go to one because they're way different than the youth prisons these kids used to be in when they were upstate. <coughs> 